I'm going to walk through some details related to two topics that were discussed in this course, Fundamentals of Corporate Finance Part 2. Uh, I'll spend most of my time going through risk adjusting cost estimates. And by the way, the following course, Course 5, is on risk management, so it goes in the concepts very well. And the last topic I want to talk on is private capital. So when you make a long-term investment in something, let's say a project, you're going to come up with your best guess as to how much money you think it's going to cost over the life cycle of this investment. So in this example we have an IT investment, a software development project, and we use like a work breakdown structure to break it down into like four phases where you define the concept requirements, you, then you move into the design of the product, you develop the solutions, you implement it. But what we want to do is we want to risk adjust this single point cost estimate and I want to show you how we do that. So what we'll do is we'll assign risk ratings for different parts or components of our cost estimate and the higher the risk rating the higher or wider the range of possible values for that cost component. And uh, so for example if you have no risk at all, there would be no risk adjustment. But if you have, let's say, an extremely high risk, we could have a cost estimate that might be 10% below our single point cost estimate, but could be as high as 200% of our single point cost estimate. So if we go back to the example where we came up with our best guess, our single point cost estimate for this IT project, we thought, okay, it's going to cost us $338,500 to do this project. So what we did was we went in and risk adjusted the four major phases of that single point cost estimate. And what we did was we looked at risk in terms of things like schedule resources, the technical difficulty, organizational issues, complexity and we came up with a composite score and once we knew what that score was that determined the range of possible values so if we had a score of two then the single point cost estimate for that component would be 10 percent less than the single point cost estimate on the low end and then it would be 50 percent higher on the high end so once we understand these ranges that basically creates what we call a three-point cost estimate or a triangular distribution. So on the low end, let's say for phase defined concept and requirements, the low end, which is the best case scenario, would be $99,000. Our most likely cost estimate, the best guess we came up with, was $110,000. And the worst case scenario is $165,000. So that's the three-point cost estimate or the triangular distribution. And once we understand that distribution, we're going to put that into a risk simulation model. The tool that I use is called Crystal Ball. And when you put this information into Crystal Ball, it shows up as an, it's an Excel add-on program, by the way. And the input values show up in green in Crystal Ball on an Excel spreadsheet. And the forecasted value shows up in blue. That's what we're trying to figure out what money we need to budget for this project. So now I'm going to run the Monte Carlo simulation and that results will come up on the next slide. So when we run our Monte Carlo simulation what it does is it'll tell us what the risk adjusted values are at different confidence intervals in 10 percent increments. At the 50 percent interval that's the average or mean value and as a minimum, that is the minimum risk adjusted number you would use. So basically what happens is, on av what I'm saying is on average, the final total cost to actually do this project could be as high as 371590 Most people accept confidence intervals above 50%. They want to be more than average right. So they choose 60, 70, and 80 percent seems to be the common ones that I see. You don't want to go too high because if you go too high, then you're allocating way too many resources to the project. So there's a balancing act that goes on when you figure out what that final risk-adjusted 
number is. So just to kind of go back, remember we started with our best guess, $338,500, okay? So now I want to be 70% certain as to what the final cost will be because things change. People change their mind, they change their requirements, there's uncertainty. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to build in a management reserve or a contingency reserve for risk and, con and unknown events. So the difference between 338500 and 3832241 is our management reserve and we're going to probably dip into some of that. So what we ask for for the budget for the whole project is 383241. And one last topic I want to talk on here, I'm going to talk kind of extensively on this one slide because I think it, there's a major point that needs to be made here, is private capital works very differently than public capital. And I think there's a tendency maybe for uh, college classes and universities, they teach financial management almost as though it revolves around publicly traded companies only. So I think it's important for people to understand that private capital works very differently than public capital. And what happens is when you go out and you decide to sell your interest in a private company, you choose a transfer channel. And the transfer channel you choose determines the value that you get when you sell your interest in a private business. So if you're a business owner and you decide you want to sell your interest in a private company. The easiest way to exit is to put a for sale sign on the front lawn and sell the assets of the business. So you'll enter into a buy sell agreement with someone and that will be driven by the asset market value. So and some companies may do that like there are wineries in California. They own a lot of valuable real estate. So it's easy if they want to liquidate that real estate, they'll get a lot of good asset market value for that real estate. So for those kinds of companies, it may be an appropriate exit channel. So let's talk about a different scenario. Let's say we have a business owner. He's getting rather old. Um, there's some young managers who work there. They feel like maybe they could run the business maybe a little bit better than the, man, the uh, business owner. So they enter into something called a management buyout or an MBO. So when you exit by an MBO, it's a little bit more difficult to structure than a buy-sell arrangement, but generally you're going to exit perhaps, generally speaking, on a higher valuation. So now let's go to a third scenario. Let's say we have another business owner and he wants to get out of the business and he realizes that the employees really have helped build the business for him and he feels kind of indebted to those employees so what he does is he sets up something called an employee stock ownership plan to transfer his ownership interest over to the employees so now we're going to structure the exit transaction through an ESOP and that will be valued using fair market value then in another scenario you may just recapitalize the balance sheet by bringing in some other equity investors. Maybe an investment banker will come in and help put some money in to the company. So that's a different type of valuation and usually typically you may have to sell the company downstream at some point so those owners can realize a real high return on their investment. Then you may just literally put the company up for sale, literally, and other companies come in and take a look and they'll look at, okay, how much synergy value can I bring to this equation, which basically means when I combine my company with your company, is there increased market value because of that merger? And then finally, the hardest type of transaction to structure is an initial public offering or an IPO, but the valuation on that exit transaction is the highest.